Indie horror games in general are seen as a cursed genre nowadays. In the literal senses, it seems that with every god tier horror game that you see everyone on YouTube play, their million and one hundred thousand malware tier games you'd find on the thirty fourth page of Itch.io and Game Jolt. As I've stated multiple times before, horror is one of those genres that you see everyone get into extremely quickly because it has a direct effect on the player, as opposed to other genres like an RPG game or a first person shooter. Horror games are literally made to elicit a reaction from the player, and in some rare cases, the viewer by proxy as they're attempting to experience what the let's player is going through with the added benefit of hindsight and the drawback of not knowing the decisions that the person's about to make. <laughs> Gotcha. Horror games in general seem to be forever cursed to having multiple threads on Reddit and V lamenting about how bad the genre has gotten and leading people to create countless threads and discussions on how to fix the horror genre. It's been the topic of many a video and many a blog post if people still do things like that now. Horror games are the ones that are most susceptible to trends in the gaming industry as it doesn't seem to take much to conjure up a big snowball effect on games copying one game mechanic and running it to the ground. All trends seem to run under the same sort of life cycle as well. It starts with a simple game. <laughs> Maybe the game was made using the last of the dev's parents' bank balance to remove the Unity watermark at the beginning of the product. Get it? Or the game was made in a government-sanctioned game jam competition in which unlucky members of the public are tasked with 30 minutes to create a fully functioning game and by the end of the time taken, the results would of course be on par with CD Projekt Red's most intense games. Ah. The point is, it always starts with a super simple game and game concept and after being rejected on the former Steam green lights, would probably get a free download on a malware-ridden site. It's through this that the game will become wildly popular with word of mouth doing wonders for the concept. YouTubers film their reaction commentaries to the game and make a thumbnail that even my grandparents would click on. Then the entire site is overrun with content creators creating content surrounding the game. Fake music videos being made for the game and garnering millions upon millions of views and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. After all of this, you then have people looking at the success the game has and salivating at the amount of bread they could acquire. So they do what they always do and beat the shit out of a dead. Capitalize on the trend. As the trend grows and more people start to catch on to it, more people People with one Skillshare tutorial in game development under their belt decide to make a quick buck and make really bad knockoffs of the super popular game and place them on any free game site and maybe even on Steam because Steam has no quality control anymore. The more people post games, the more people start getting genuinely mad at the existence of the base game which leads the entire genre to become oversaturated. After this oversaturation, it's at this point that the original creator of the base game, who is now insanely rich and living a lavish life in a very expensive villa in Portugal, decides to come out of hibernation and either make a tweet denouncing the entire franchise saying that they've moved on or some shit, or they want more bread and decide to make a longer way to sequel to the game, expecting hundreds of thousands of retweets and a standing ovation in the E3 crowd. They're probably only met with It's after this that the trend has a very extreme downward spiral or just drops dead on the ground. Now I bet you're all probably thinking, Actually, you named 28 games this is happening. Well, I can't give you 28, but I can say that this trend is especially notable with the 2012 game Slender, made by Parsec Productions. Now, everyone remembers Slender, or at least I very much hope they still do. I'll consider myself at my young age a bloody boomer if people generally do not remember the first Slender game. Everyone remembers the original Slender game and how it completely exploded across the internet. What's that? A free-to-play collection-based horror game based on a semi-popular urban legend? I, I refuse to say creepypasta. Oh wow, oh boy, I can't wait to get my hands on this one! Everyone on the entire planet and their mothers were playing this game, if not for the scares then for the dark and moody atmosphere that the game brought to the table, regardless of the software that the game was made on. After the original Slender blew up on another level, this prompted every indie game dev under the sun to have a crack at creating a Slender game. I, I mean, it's not that hard, right? Just go into Unity or Unreal and get a bunch of tree models and sprinkle them across a plain field. It got to the point that people were straight up making parodies of the original. You had Slender originally set in a forest, then you had the setting switch to a hospital, a school, a mansion, a spaceship, another spaceship, yet another spaceship, another spaceship, another school, another mansion, a playground, a prison, a Christmas party... Your mum. There were remakes after spin-offs of the base game and all of them kinda sucked because they took the main concept of the original Slender game and multiplied it by 300. Collecting some notes? How about we have you collect each page from the fifth Harry Potter book? Ominous music while you're collecting the pages? Let's just smash every key on the keyboard multiple times. That's proper scary. These games seem to derive all of their horror from the existence of jump scares, which completely misses what made the original Slender game so good. Tension in the game was built through the horrible graphics. You can't look at the game and think it's going to win the game award for best art direction, it's just not I mean, look at it. But regardless of how it looked, it knew how to build tension the right way. The non-existent narrative which was retrospectively expanded on is pretty much told only through 8 pages. 8 ominous notes that lets the player know that there's a force of evil that's corrupted the character, and whatever happened to them? 
it will happen to you. Now, after this, a sequel was announced titled Slender The Arrival. It's essentially Slender on crack and expands on the story, adding more lore to the world that's been created at the start of the franchise in the first game. It's after the second game is created and the fact that it seemingly ended on a cliffhanger or a downer ending if we're going by the Steam version of the game, that the trend of moping around the place collecting repetitive notes seemed to have come to an end. Welcome to Molly's Basics in Education and Learning. That's me! Ah, shit. But I will leave that to another video. Now, there was a period of time where good horror indie games seemed very rare, and it could have been because either everyone grew out of the idea or no one could be bothered to make them after the Slender Craze died. I know there were other games like SCP Containment Breach and its many spin offs, but that one's also for another video. It's from this derelict environment that Scott Cawthon came in. The first and original Five Nights at Freddy's game was released on August the 8th, 2014. After a string of random educational religious games, one of which featuring unintentionally terrifying animals as main characters, he decided to switch things around and make an intentionally terrifying game, but this time instead of actual animals, he decided to use animatronics, tapping into an American restaurant visitor's kids' worst nightmare. Upon release of the game, the hype and the buzz surrounding it started out slow, then all of a sudden... It blows up through let's plays of the game and people spreading the word at breakneck volume and speed. Everyone who played the game at the time claimed it was freaky as hell, with some claiming that the game's amongst of, if not the scariest games they've ever played. That's a very bold claim if you ask me, probably played scarier to be honest. Anyways, with every bold claim that's brought forward, there has to be an assessment as to why the game's so scary, so for the two people who live under a rock, I'll give an oversight as to what exactly the game entails and why it's deemed so scary without going to Matt Patty. Night one. It's 12 a.m. in the morning. Why in the fuck you choose a time like this to start working in a place like this is beyond me. There are a million and one things you could take your GCSEs to. Come on. It's 12 a.m. and you're poor blood, and you're tasked with watching four robot animals who are safely stored in the back room in the case that they get stolen or something along those lines. Absolutely nothing freaky about that whatsoever. However, with everything, of course, there's a twist. The animatronics like to get a little active in the night a little too active for your liking. You have until your shift ends at 6am to just chill in the office, but these animatronics really want to get you for some reason, so you need to keep them in check by looking at them through security cameras as they seem to be on some iRobot Skynet shit and have a mind of their own. Your new objective is made clear, stop them from entering the room that you're in, whatever it takes. Failure to do what you're told to and letting the animatronics into the room that you're currently in would result in DEAD. Oh. Before I forget, there's a power counter on the bottom left corner of the screen and you need to keep that afloat for the entire time. In what universe does an entire restaurant run on an energizer battery? Why do we have to worry about how much power is left in the building? This isn't the 1400s anymore! Before I get sidetracked again, there's a power counter and you have to keep that afloat for the entire time and either using the lights, the camera or the doors will cause the power to run out quicker as if it's an iPhone 5 or something. When the power hits zero, all the doors will open and all the lights will turn off. You better hope to god you are near the end of the night by the time the power runs out or else there's going to be trouble. Seeing as the game is called Five Nights at Freddy's, you have to do this a total of seven times. Maths. The game doesn't really hold your hand to understand the gameplay, there are no tutorials and no BS. The only thing you have is a guy with limited minutes on his phone to tell you what's up, right up until the beginning of the fourth night. It's at that night that the guy's credit runs out. Or he, he, he just gets killed by the animatronics. Probably that. This guy on the phone is pretty much the typical wise guy in the film that answers the questions that the audience wants answers to, and of course he has to die to build tension in the game. But nothing to fear, in night five you hear the phone again, so it's obvious he got a pay as you go add on. Oh. Shit. As the game gets progressively harder and each of the animatronics try more convoluted ways to get into the room you're in or get into your head, you have to have your wits about you as much as you can until by the end of night five, you win. <laughs> You get a paycheck of just $125. Knowing your character, you're probably going to convert that 125 to 125000000. Zero. Zero. In legal reparations after what you've been through. But that doesn't stop the fact that you've completed the game. 
or have you? When you complete the game, you unlock night six, which is a much harder night. And if you pass that, you get access to night seven, where you have the opportunity to configure the animatronics to make them as easy or as hard as possible to escape from in the six hours you have to survive for. I've spent all this time describing the game without describing the animatronics and characters in this game, so I'll do that as fast as possible, even though you should probably already know what they're referred to as for better or for worse. Bunny. He's a purple bunny with a burstwood guitar or something. He's highly aggressive, likes to mess with the player, comes in on your left hand side and frequently gets to the door to give you weird chord sounds when you turn on the lights and he's there. Chica. She's a yellow chicken if that wasn't blatantly obvious from the name. She comes in from the right, messes about in the kitchen throughout the game and is probably the cooking animatronic in the pizzeria. She has a let's eat bib and has some weird ass teeth too. There's Pyrocynical. He hides in his own little hut called Pirate Cove and he's a special case in the literal sense. You can't look at him too regularly or he'll come after you. You can't look at him too little or he'll come after you. There's literally no winning with him. And finally, the titular character, Freddy Fazbear, the only one with a surname because he's not your mate and therefore you don't get to know him on a first name basis. He's the main antagonist and isn't even introduced aggressively until night four, after which things get creepy very fast. Now, I've spent so long talking about the game, but what exactly made it so scary? Before I discuss the answer, I think it's probably worth noting that horror is a very subjective genre. Someone could find an Eldritch Abomination from the deaths of Hex scary, whereas others could find the act of turning on the PC with Windows XP on in the middle of the night horrifying. That's why there's so many weird phobias, some of which are probably clearly made to piss the one or two victims off. But there's so many phobias to choose from. Pick your poison, I say. One of the things that made this game so scary, at the time of release, was that you were completely and utterly defenseless throughout the game. There's no jumping out of your seat and going stupid on these animatronics. Other games such as Silent Hill and Resident Evil gave you some solace in that they gave you a way out and a means of escape against any incoming antagonists that are out to get you. And independent games like the original Slender and SCP gave you a temporary means of escape and some sort of a way to evade the monster. If you saw something creepy, you'd realistically turn 360 degrees and walk away. Five Nights doesn't give you that luxury. In the first game, you are completely and utterly rooted to the spots and the only weapon you have is yourself more specifically your brain, and a security camera, and some buttons on the door. Apart from that, you're bait! In the game, there's completely and utterly no escape from your predicament unless you successfully prevent your enemies from getting in the room. And should you fail in your task to prevent them from entering, you get okay, deaded. Blah, blah, blah. On the topic of jump scares, jump scares aren't actually that inherently that. good, especially in a game like this, as they'd pretty much just assist in getting you angrier and angrier. A case in point would be people who played the harder modes in the game. Playing it too much would just mean you get used to the jump scares and every time you die in a game, a little piece of you dies in real life or something along those lines. As opposed to other horror games where jump scares are seen as bait, these jump scares are directly your fault. If you get scared, that's only your own loss. If you do strip the concept of the game down to the bare minimum, it's pretty much a jump scare simulator in which you prevent yourself from getting jump scared. No one likes a jump scare. Now, another reason why the game was seen as scary was the fact that the animatronics in and of itself were kind of creepy anyway. I won't talk about the later games in the series just yet, and there's also a point to be made that they just aren't scary anymore because they pretty much be memed in and out of existence extremely quickly, but I'm just going to confine this point to the first game. It's clear that the animatronics were a play on the type of innocent animatronics and mascots you see on old advertisements, and especially in America, you'd see them in some restaurants giving kids a good time. That probably sounded wrong. These animatronics are normally innocent colourful animals that play music and sing to little children, but at the dead of night they turn into murderous creatures. Pretty much sounds like a night out in Reading, honestly. What the game does so well is display a juxtaposition between something you normally associate with joy and make them grim. Some of the renders and the hallucinations throughout the franchise also make them much more creepy than normal. I'm not going to go all TV tropes and start talking about how the souls of these animatronics have been corrupt in society for hundreds of years and therefore kids can get a little scared or something, but especially in the horror genre, people tend to get tired of the same old long-legged, long-haired, hooded creature. Stuff like that just isn't scary anymore. In many cases, people's nightmare fuel tends to come from things that are perceived as innocent and for kids. For example, the jump scares. <laughs> I'd expect those kind of sounds from my old laptop as it attempts to run Crisis 3 on Ultra Graphics or something. Now, while the game was highly influential, it didn't come without some major drawbacks, and the biggest one would be the fact that the game doesn't really have any replay value. The game was made on a point and click engine, and people's interest in the game would wane as soon as the game dies. Once you've completed all the nights in the game, there's literally no reason to come back to it. You'd uninstall it, delete all the files, refund your purchase, delete System 32, throw the monitor out the window, smash your PC, and sell it on eBay for a profit. Now, knowing this, Scott needed to make something and do it fast, so he went back to the drawing board and came out a few months later with
Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was released in 2014. With the sequel made that quickly, you'd think he'd have moved to a farm with the amount of milking he's about to do, but in a much quicker fashion, I'm going to explain the concept and the atmosphere that the game brought to the table for people living under an earthquake shelter or something. So sit back, try to relax, and enjoy this information dump. First things first, the game really ups the ante from the first game. This sequel is pretty much the first game but on crack. And it really shows as soon as you open the game. There's three characters in the menu for fuck's sake! Instead of four animatronics, there's just one, two, three, four, five, six. Th there are loads of animatronics you need to keep tabs on. You've now got cooler, more modern looking versions of each of the animatronics from the first game and some new ones enter the mix that you need to learn. As with the first game, it's exactly the same rules. Survive until 6am. But now there's no power! and no doors. The only thing you are armed with is your brain and a security camera and a flashlight you need to flash in a long-winded corridor where monsters can enter the room through there or from the vent. The businessmen behind the entire Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria operation really want their workers dead, manufacturing several ways for animatronics to get into the main office. Or maybe it's the underpaid, overworked architects. Anyway, you start the game with a pleasant surprise. The guy on the phone is back. He's paid his overdue balance and has enough credit on his phone to talk to you now. It's only a little bit odd that he's able to talk to you right now though. Didn't something happen to him in the first game, aka he died? As well as the metric fuck ton of animatronics that you now need to worry about, you now have to pay attention to a little puppet that stays in one music room. And you have to keep the music box wound up remotely or something. Failure to do so will result in an automatic dead. So to pretty much clarify just how fucked you are, you have to watch loads of animatronics in the security camera, listen for several audio cues, shine a flashlight down a corridor and two vents on either side of you, and a new game mechanic, the mask. The guy on the phone lets you know that the mask will assist you throughout the night. You need to wear the mask if there's literally any sign of any animatronic entering the room. However, since this entire building is out to kill you, you can only wear the mask for a set amount of time before you run out of air. And they can fool all the animatronics into thinking you're one of them, apart from Foxy who still comes down the corridor. And you still need to make sure that the puppet is wound up or it's an instant death. It's no surprise that people dubbed Five Nights at Freddy's 2 the Crash Insane trilogy of the horror genre. Yeah, they didn't. But you get where I'm coming from. This game is hard. In order to keep the game fair and square, Scott had to warm the bench and put some animatronics out of action some of the night so the game doesn't bombard you with constant jump scares as you play. On the topic of jump scares though... <laughs> Now a lot of you are probably going to be rattling off comments calling for my immediate death. Or not because the jump scares are literally just PNGs zooming at the camera. Golden Freddy, which is an easter egg character in the first game that completely crashes the game when encountered and not dealt with, is literally a PNG of a head flying at the camera with a loud noise. Bruh. But th that's laziness! You can make a jump scare out of anything when there's a loud sound accompanying it. Watch me do it now. Aha. You probably thought I was going to scare you there, but you thought incorrectly. The game also has a fair bit of story in it. Like I said before, I'm not going to go into the story because literally every person in the multiverse has covered the story there and back. But Scott added in some mini games that are meant to vaguely add to the ongoing storyline with a creepy 8-bit aesthetic and weird noises that sounded like someone burping into a headset microphone and compressing the hell out of it. Nothing much happens in the mini games, but then there's another PNG zooming into the camera and you're back in the menu. All right then, what was the point of that? While you're playing the game, especially towards the end, there's a major twist in what you're playing is a prequel. The game is set before the first one, which is kind of weird because the studio and some of the animatronics look better slash worse for wear than the first one. But who am I to question the word of the Lord in current year? There were a couple of things that made this game effectively scarier than the first one mere months after its release. Since it was released so fast after the first game, it kept the game and the animatronics fresh in people's minds. You couldn't go into a thread talking about horror games without someone bringing up the hey, game. Hey, have you heard of this anime? A gem called Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah! While this may have been the case, however, the game turned into a rage game later in its life. It carried the same vibe as the first game where you're trying not to get jump scared, but in this one it's much, much harder because now you need to have eyes literally everywhere around you to get through each of the nights. This is made painstakingly obvious in the coveted 1020 mode, which is already a pretty bloody difficult task that's been completed by very few. Now it's borderline impossible because there's so much to follow. It's like playing Osu on hard mode with Parkinson's. Again, in this game, you're completely and utterly defenseless, but this time you're out in the open with none of the comfiness of the offices from the first game, which meant you're more exposed to potential threats in a corridor that's pretty much bait for nightmare fuel. So in general, the game's pretty fucking creepy, but there's still that nothingness after completion, seven out of 10, onto the next one. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released early in 2015, and yep, 
You can now bring the horses over because he's beating the ever-loving shit out of them at this point. I'm gonna just jump right into it and explain the game for people living in the shadows by Matthew Perryman Jones. It's a good song, by the way. You should probably listen to it. Before I talk about the game's mechanics, I'm going to say that this one, in my opinion, is a massive downgrade from the first two, and it had everything going for it to be an effective, scary game. The environment that you're supposed to be surviving in is literally a horror attraction. You'd think that that would be the scariest game concept ever, but this game really blew it. There's only one animatronic coming after you around the premises of the building. This game is much easier than the first two, but it's a lot more anger inducing as you now have to keep an eye on the ventilation shafts and the cameras just in case the main animatronic wants to get through and there's already some red flags. Who the fuck is that guy? It doesn't look like a bear. Maybe it identifies as one or something. Even though Springtrap, the main animatronic, is the only animatronic, other animatronics appear through the looking glass and warnings in places to let you know that you're about to be jump scared. But it's a hallucination! As opposed to the game just ending when you get jump scared, they damage an integral part of the power in the area. Springtrap is basically a BTEC Morrison's valued Xenomorph, so it's attracted by sound. So in this game, you fool it by playing sounds in different areas of the base, but there are some cases where it doesn't get fooled whatsoever. When you get jump scared by each of the hallucinations, it can damage the sound, the vents, or the visuals, and I don't know whether this was intentional or not, but sometimes the buttons just don't fucking work. You'll be clicking like a madman trying to make it work. Your mouse will be nothing but dust and blood by the end of the final night. The jump scares in this game aren't effective, you get a very big warning in that he slides behind the camera to prepare to jump scare you. As per all the games in the franchise, you have to survive until 6am as per usual, but this time... The bridge between each night is a lot more story based than the first two games. Again, I won't explain much, this is becoming a theme in this video, but the general gist is that all the animatronics in the franchise are possessed by kids that have been killed before. The murderer is the purple man. Each night shows the purple man killing another kid, and in the final night, they have a gamers rise up moment and trap the purple man in an animatronic suit to kill him in the end. That is, if you get the good ending. The bad ending really doesn't have much to go from, if I'm honest. Now, if it hasn't been made glaringly obvious by the fact that I'm skimming over this game extremely quickly, you can probably tell that I'm a very fierce critic of the game. There's a fair few people, including me, that think it's the worst. Let me tell you why. First things first, you don't even play most of the nights. The person who's on the phone must have infinite credit because he just walks you through the nights for a long ass time. I was completely fine with the quick tutorials the guy, which coincidentally is the same VA as all of the games, cause it's Scott, was doing because he had to be proactive for the entire night, but you literally do nothing for the first night. Most of the jump scares in this game are more elaborate and sacrificed for a concise story, for better and worse for the franchise. Part of the reason why the franchise was so creepy was because the entire thing was ambiguous and left to the imagination of the player and the viewer. When you start feeding players with a bible then there's an issue. Also to add to this, setting the game in an abandoned horror attraction is purely creepy past a bay, and making the design scary to start with doesn't really add to the creepy factor that the first two games did with characters that are arguably made creepy. All in all, the game seems to have concluded the mainline storyline. That is, until... Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was released in 2015, and clearly there used to be a threshold and Scott's clearly passed it, but he decided to keep going and see what happens, but there's a massive twist! This game is arguably the creepiest for reasons I'll get into later, so without further ado, I'm going to describe this whole game for people dying under the pressure of not being the best they could possibly be. Wholesomeness! Whoa, this game's completely and utterly different to any game in the franchise. There's no more officers, the company's entered administration and the entire operation's packing up and leaving. But they've brought the party with them and now you're playing as a child who's hiding in this big ass room. This kid must be in team 10 or something, this room is large as hell. Walking from one corner to the other would take 40 seconds. Oh, and instead of watching animatronics through a camera so you can at least know when they're coming, you now have to look through a dark corridor and listen for them. You also get absolutely zero help and you're armed with only your ears to catch the animatronics trying to scare you. This will effectively lead to moments where your volume is all the way up and you're listening carefully, only to get your ears obliterated by the loudest jump scare known to man. Now there are different locations in this big ass room that you need to watch out for. Behind you is a bed, where Toy Plushie or Freddy is. Not looking at that section for long enough will result in a creepier version of the plushie appearing. Failure to look at that for too long will immediately result in dead. You have the closet, not active for most nights and for a lot of the time until Foxy enters the room. When he does, you now have to look inside the closet. Not too frequently, but not too sparsely. Foxy's in various levels of aggression depending on how frequently you look at it. You have two corridors on either side of the room. Most British houses would be lucky for their bedrooms to even have a single window, let alone a door or two, Bonnie and Chica come through the corridors and you need to listen out for them. If they breathe in your ear, you're asked to shut the door until you hear footsteps walking away. Sometimes it's bait though, and they fully shag you as a result. Because of this, the game is much, much harder. But at least there's help now. 
The nights are much shorter and there are mini games to help you pass through the night. There's an audio based game mode that requires you to stop a plushy version of Springtrap from attacking you right on the X. And again, that's audio based and you only have footsteps to let you know that he's walking down. If you pass, you get to skip two hours into the night and you have much less to worry about, but failure to do so results in <laughs> and you have to restart the night too. Makes you wonder why the kids walking around different areas of the house at night. Just just go to bed, mate. Where are your parents? The answer to that would probably be in the story that Scott blended into this installment. The kid you're playing as has his birthday party in five days and his siblings really like to jump scare him a lot. These are seen in the cutscenes throughout the game in the transition to each night. The big day arrives and during his birthday party, they go to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria or something along those lines and carry him Spider-Man 2 style to the animatronic who accidentally bites down on his head and kills him, dead. <laughs> Nights 5 is a special night because it only involves one nightmarish animatronic. Technically speaking, this should be piss, right? Wrong. It runs around the entire house at 200 miles per hour and teleports in and out of your room. Now what about the jump scares? Well in this game they're extremely effective because the entire game is audio based and there's just a grim atmosphere surrounding the entire thing, so when you least expect it, you get your ears blown out with the 120% volume VLC jump scare. The animatronics in this game actually look extremely unsettling, but that helps the scares because they're more effective than all the other games. As opposed to the other games where you turn into a TV when you die, this game pretty much confirms that you are deceased when you get jump scares. God bless the UK housing crisis, you don't get any of the situations that you have in that game in the UK because our houses are so sodding small. Brexit really does mean Brexit. Anyway, this game didn't really get glowing critical reviews because of its mechanics, so I feel like a contrarian in this case when I say the game was effectively scary and did its job to service the franchise effectively. On release of the game, it was treated as the main finale of the franchise, and because that's the case, I'll be treating this like the finale of this video because it's these games mechanics established by these four games that changed and arguably ruined so much in the horror industry. If people want more in-depth analysis on the story of the game, there are about a million and ninety-one people who've done this already all over the site, so you can go watch those ones. But don't do it yet because I haven't finished, damn it! Scott Cawthon really is the greatest businessman of the 21st century. Now hear me out, hear me out. Discount all the other people who probably invested in Bitcoin once ever and put entrepreneur on their Instagram bio. Who'd have thought that a guy who made one stupid game would amass this empire of dirt? He managed to single-handedly create and release a can of worms in the form of this horror mechanic that people are still copying to, to this day. day. After the release of FNAF, the whole concept of helplessness and the need to survive made a swift return to horror. Newer horror games that use this mechanic in the hype include Emily Wants to Play and its sequel, Emily Wants to Play 2. Too. Emily's game is a very good example of fleshing out the concept. In that game, you need to survive until a set amount of time armed with nothing but a flashlight, if you can even find it, and bait on the board, telling you to do the opposite of what you're supposed to do. This leads to some very funny reactions as people realise that the board is one big fat lie. Toys are slowly introduced into that game the same way the animatronics are, but there's much more freedom in movement and you're still defenceless. You can't just pick up the toy, chuck it across the room and run for your life this time. You can only do the last option. It's also a much longer game, but you still essentially have to survive the night, it's just split into different hours with save points each hour. The game was released a critical and commercial success and a much longer sequel was made, which slightly fleshed out on the very vague story which was told in the monologue at the end of it. Another game that tried the same kind of concept was Sophie's Curse. That game is notorious in the YouTube community for being very hard and having very effective jump scares. <laughs> Shit, you weren't even safe when you reach a checkpoint, you get jump scared by the guy pretty much climaxing really loudly. <sighs> but where that game failed was that everything was too sudden and it started to get very frustrating as the night went on, so I could see why a lot of people who played the game ended up giving up in the long run. In addition to this, the existence of Five Nights at Freddy's has had an effect on the indie horror game industry because that game seriously triggered Game Jolt and Ichio's user base to the point of making clones and parodies and spin-offs of the FNAF games, each with different gimmicks or jump scares. One of the best examples would probably be One Night of Flum too. Now I'm not going to say much about the first game because that was a clear cut copy of the original Five Nights game, but the second game took everything up to the 11 and came up with a complete and original creepy environment, having everything hand drawn and animated and flash as opposed to this weird 3D effect in the FNAF game. There's only one night and there's only one hallway with different creatures out to get you with their own unique ways of getting in and out, with seamless animations that would make James Baxter proud. It's only one night unless you count the extra hard mode, but the game just radiates tension. Other games that attempted to piggyback off the success of the franchise tend to fall flat in terms of the scares because what made the original so scary was the vague story and the fact that you are helpless and rooted to the spot for the entirety of the game. The Joy of Creation was an Unreal Engine edition of the entire franchise and it was fleshed out even more in the story mode edition of the game which had... Okay. 
okay voice acting. The game kind of falls flat in comparison to the original though because there's something about the concept of the game having the player being stuck in one position and that was creepy. But making it a try hard Unreal Engine flash jump scare simulator kind of loses the scare factor of the original. In general though, with an upcoming film and several spin-offs with varying degrees of quality, there is no lie that the original four games changed indie horror in more ways than one. But it can be argued that the trend might be gone now due to people making knockoffs of the cancelled PT game obligatory fuck Konami. It seems like horror may be stagnating again as a result of so many people trying to capture the thunder of Five Nights at Freddy's, PT and others among those lines. But maybe there'll be that one game that captures the hearts and minds of everyone in the gaming industry in the horror genre. And that is it. Remember how I said I was going to focus on my channel for the entirety of this year and subsequently uploaded a video every other week as a result of my newfound interest in creating videos? Yeah, me neither. I'm sorry. Making videos is hard and I had to take a break or else I probably would have ignited at my desk and exploded into smithereens. But at least I'm back now indefinitely. As much as it looks like on my channel I haven't been moping around on my desk waiting for my skin to deteriorate, I've been writing a lot of long form videos for this channel because you guys really seem to like that kind of content. So I thought to myself, why not give the audience more of what they want? So while I was gone I've been writing super long scripts and while I've scrapped a lot of the ideas in favour of others, I've got some ready to record and hopefully they take a lot less to make than the break I took from my last video, which did surprisingly well for a film review so for that I thank you guys. I hope this video kind of justifies why I've been out for so long but I I've been working and writing multiple different videos that I think you guys will enjoy a lot. But if you're tired of waiting for new content from me, I'll take this time to announce that I have a podcast with iNabba called The Coffee Club. We're trying to run it every week and we talk about film and games, so if you want unscripted heavy discussion about how bad Endgame was or something, that's the place to go. I'm also going to be focusing a lot on my Patreon now that I've got more time to work on content. So if you want more perks like early access, producer credit, project files and similar stuff, then head on over to my Patreon and join my Discord server for video discussion and stuff along those lines. Everything will be linked in the description. Thanks again for being patient with me and I hope to see you all in another video.